when when ego is spoken about in spirituality in, in some spirituality and much of spirituality perhaps not all it's spoken of as if it's a thing yeah some part of us psychological part perhaps lodged in the mind lodged in the brain somewhere <laughs> that yeah so even just saying that yeah can you see how we lock into form already we've sort of become focused on the form the form of the ego where is it what is it how can i identify it how can i get rid of it <clears throat> but the ego is not a form <laughs> as such it's a process it's an ongoing process that becomes part of our operating system, our default. It's the process of interpreting and interfering with our experience which leads to identification with that experience with the content of that experience let's open that up the interpretation of experience is the division into this or that always opposites and some continuum in between but it's on the it's in the realm of the horizontal yeah at one extreme evil <laughs> at the other extreme extreme benevolence or blessing yeah? good and bad dark and light right and wrong good and evil so when our experience is interpreted somewhere along that continuum then we've boxed it into a welcome experience or an unwelcome experience a good experience or a bad experience a lucky experience or an unlucky experience. And the interpretation interpretation of an unlucky or unwelcome or uncomfortable or unpleasant or intense or yeah, experience is that this shouldn't be happening. This shouldn't be happening to me, because it's all about me. <laughs> this shouldn't be happening. It shouldn't be happening. I don't want it. I don't like it. I didn't ask for it. This shouldn't be happening to me. We've interpreted the experience. And with that comes interference. If it shouldn't be happening, then there's a strategy involved, a psychological, emotional, mental strategy of suppressing it. If it's an intense feeling, an emotion, anger, sadness, yeah, rage, whatever it is, then there's this strategy to push it down, suppress it, not actually feel it. Yeah? Or to numb out, to space out, that was my strategy. I numbed out uncomfortable feelings. I was a little bit, you know, spacey. I don't know about spacey, but there was a, a whole, um, you know, texture of the human realm that I was out of touch with. I just couldn't feel it. So then we live these kind of 
you know, in a, na in a narrow band. In the meantime, there's all this stuff going on underneath, and that's what triggers are. <laughs> Something comes along, penetrates that little band, and we're triggered, and suddenly it's like you feel incredible rage, or you want to kill somebody, or yeah. And it's like, oh, where did that come from? <laughs> and so on yeah so we in interpret and then interfere interpretation is the division of our experience it's the divided mind that's compartmentalizing categorizing according to what we've somehow learned been conditioned to believe is good or bad that hurts us or doesn't hurt us if it's hurt us in the past then we want to protect ourselves from it. Now, that's a natural response, but when it becomes the psychological default position, then it's inappropriate and unhealthy, unwholesome in many cases, because feelings don't kill us. Intense emotions don't kill us. On the contrary, suppressing intense emotions, or well, they become intense emotions when they're suppressed, that does kill us slowly. It affects your immune system. <clears throat> so interpreting and interfering with experience is the process of ego formation. Why is it ego formation? Well, it starts to build and we're using metaphors, visual metaphors to describe something that is obviously invisible. Nobody's actually seen this. <laughs> but the process of interpretation and interference starts to build an emotional and mental scaffolding. Yeah? Nuts and bolts that say, I won't feel this, I can't feel this, this is bad, this is wrong. And so we build up a whole array of these strategies to avoid, to protect in an unhealthy way, yeah? to defend or to attack, to create a boundary. And this becomes the ego shell. And in that ego shell, eventually we feel imprisoned. So it's a process, it's not static. It's just become automatic over years and years and years. We learn this when we're young, from culture, from our family, from our ancestry, from the unconscious human condition. So it's a process, it's fluid. What has this got to do with identity? Well, this scaffolding becomes our identity. This scaffolding, scaffolding becomes who I think I am, who I think I am as a broken person, a victimized person, a happy person, a angry person, a <laughs> whatever it might be. So if you look inside that, you'll see that the identity, the identity of self is actually derived from the content of experience. I experience this feeling, this emotion, this thought, which has been categorized, interpreted and interfered with. And my identity is derived from the content of experience. That's why we go through life trying to change the content of our experience, the content of our lives, so that my identity can be drawn from that. Whether it's success or accumulation of things or recognition or approval or love in the form of the love that we might think we're getting from somebody, belonging. This is all derivation of identity from the content of experience. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't improve our lives or <laughs> have beauty in our lives or abundance and all that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about deriving our identity solely from that.
that's a prison that keeps us limited to what's happening, limited to form. So there's nothing to kill here. There's nothing to get rid of because there's no thing. The ego is not a thing. Neither is it about changing the form, the form of this body mind vehicle, this personality, let's call it, this individuation, this unique expression. It's not about changing that so that you have a better ego or less ego. This is looking in the wrong direction. It's about turning our attention, our awareness, our inquiry to the true source of identity. We can say it two ways. Let's, let's start with undoing the hook from the content of our experience, unhooking identity from the content of our experience. It's not about killing the ego or getting rid of it. It's about undoing the possibility or potential of undoing the scaffolding that holds it all together. And one of the main pins in that scaffolding is this shouldn't be happening to me. Because it's always happening to me, isn't it? You don't know what's happening to him, her, they. <laughs> it's happening to me. This shouldn't be happening. So we start right there. We start to look how we interpret, we, we get honest with ourselves about how we are, are interpreting reality. Reality is whatever is happening, whatever I'm experiencing, yeah, the energies, the feelings, the, yeah, even the thoughts. Yeah, this is what's happening. But to unstick that it shouldn't be happening, I shouldn't be having this thought, well, this thought shouldn't be appearing in space, <laughs> in consciousness. Why not? The clouds appear, the bird appeared. Why shouldn't it? It is this feeling, this sensation, this whatever it is. That way we start to undo interpretation. We start to undo this division, internal division. I mean, there are many layers to this, depending on where we're at <clears throat> in our capacity to see. When we stop labeling every experience, with this shouldn't be happening, or it's bad, it's evil, it's wrong, it's painful, it's this. Yes, it may be painful, ouch. Emotionally painful, physically painful. Yeah, we can feel that, we do feel that. So there's no denying of that. But to add layers of interpretation on top of that, that makes us out of touch with the direct felt sense and it becomes a mental construct that's the beginning of the ego formation so we can stop labeling <laughs> we'll see how much we label and then see ah no need to label just feel just feel don't add a judgment on it a value judgment on this pendulum swing of right wrong And then we can start to see how we interfere with experience. And it can be very subtle. You know, this, it's quite common. This was my thing a long time ago, that when I was alone, socially alone, without a relationship, whatever, This kind of sense of 
dread would appear like a big black hole that was going to swallow me up. It was an energetic feeling. It's like, oh. And I noticed at some point that I just would do anything to move away from that. And that anything was very subtle. Read a book was the usual one, because then that gave me some sense of inspiration. Uplift. Nothing wrong with that. But when it became a strategy, an unconscious strategy to avoid what is here as a felt sense, then it's a cover up. It becomes part of the prison. Constantly looking for comfort or avoidance. What is it? Is it that piece of cake, that cup of tea, that book, that inspirational book? Is it picking up the phone and speaking with somebody? Yeah. What's driving our behavior? And yet that aloneness was the doorway to God. All the time I'd been avoiding it. So there are many strategies that we have. So we can start to see those. Again, it's not about beating ourselves up or really kind of making it into some tight effort or practice. It's just noticing and being honest with ourselves. Do we interpret our experience? Do we interfere with our experience? Are we available for the direct felt sense of what is? And so we can start to see how we derive our identity from the content of our experience. And the majority of humanity is doing that endlessly, endlessly running around, trying to get this, do that, all for identity of self, adding layers to the prison of self. When we're free of deriving our identity from the content of our experience, then we, it's as if there's space. <laughs> yeah, this is the, you know, then the infinite opens up. The infinite, infinity is able to enter us. Yeah? Instead of our self, our identity, our world being this, me and the content of my experience, it gets exhausting, yeah, because I've got to keep experience in a certain way in order for me to think of myself as, as, as what? Safe person, good person, loving person, lovable person, worthy person. Yeah? And then we go seeking that all the time in different ways, in different forms. Yeah? When the scaffolding comes undone, that's the boundary. It's a psychological boundary, if you like. So this, this won't come undone, even though this is also somewhat permeable. <laughs> You're not going to become a blubbering mess, a pool of nothingness on the floor. The body will still be here, but there is psychological space, if you like. Infinity, the infinity of consciousness can infuse you, imbue you with the light of beingness, 